everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Theo Rakatzinas. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His work focuses on machine learning methods and systems over structured data. Theo is also a co-founder of Inductive, which developed technology that uses artificial intelligence to automate processes that involve identifying and correcting errors in data. Inductive is now part of Apple. This talk describes Marius, a software system that aims to make scaling of modern AI models over billion edge um, graphs dramatically easier. Please ask any questions you may have in the chat and I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, thank you Michelle for, for the intro. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, for the talk. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So today I will talk about Marius, which is a new system that uh, we have been developing to enable large scale machine learning over graphs. Uh, and we're talking about really large scale graphs with billions of edges. And our goal is really to on, not only unlock faster execution, but also reduce the monetary costs associated with running large scale machine learning models over such graphs. So before I start, I would like to introduce the team uh, and my collaborators in this project. So. A special call out to the students, uh, the PhD students at Madison, Jason and Roger, who have been leading uh, this project. They, they are instrumental in designing and developing Marius um, and a big uh, uh, call out to them. So why did we choose to focus on graphs for, for this uh, system? So graphs really enable us to capture very rich interactions between entities and Typically, one would denote entities as nodes and, and capture these different relationships that entities have via typed edges. Then this representational power of, of graphs really allows them to model data across a diverse array of fields. For example, in sciences, we may have uh, graphs represent molecules or even interactions between particles and high energy physics. And in the digital world, uh, we can use graphs to model open knowledge and interactions between different computational systems. So really, graphs are universal representations of free semantics about entities and their relationships. And we can really harness these semantics uh, encoded in, in graphs to perform predictive and reasoning tasks and gain new insights. For instance, we can leverage uh, the connectivity of nodes in the graph to perform node classification or predict new edges, uh, or even cluster related entities and identify uh, relations between different uh, taxa, for instance, or, or entity types. So reasoning uh, a lot over this uh, structure can be quite powerful and of course, like any other field in, in AI or, or analytics, modern machine learning, specifically deep learning, has uh, uh, been leading uh, the way and has been taking over these, these predictive tasks over graphs. So to apply deep learning methods, methods over, over graphs, really we need to follow uh, an encoding decoding process. And first we need to represent nodes and edges as uh, vectors, uh, real valued uh, uh, vectors. And then we can use the power of neural networks to perform either classification or link prediction. But this, while this picture might seem uh, quite nice and, and straightforward, uh, I would like to highlight that there is a main uh, bottleneck and the main cuts uh, behind this uh, pretty picture. And that is really that graph learning is really memory and uh, IO bound. Performing graph learning over large scale graphs uh, is, is quite expensive. And over the next few slides, I will try to explain uh, why. And this is exactly uh, the key bottleneck that Marius uh, is addressing. So, so to address, understand this, this bottleneck, let's focus really on the encoding uh, step of the process I, I just uh, mentioned. And here, remember again, our goal is to go from nodes to edge and edge types to really to real valued vectors so that we can apply uh, matrix uh, and based operations, linear algebra and, and deep learning and so on. One thing to keep in mind while we're going over this exercise is that really graphs introduce irregular access patterns because of the sparsity of the data. So let's see an abstract definition of a workload that will give us this type of encoding. Uh, specifically here, we will focus on, on training uh, and learning these, these networks by iterating over all edges 
uh, of the graph. Each of it, its ads can be viewed as a, a training example. And what we want to, to do in terms of pseudocode while iterating over uh, these training examples for its ads, which means for two node embeddings, two node vectors and one edge type vector, we want to compute the loss of our model, compute gradients and so on. And afterwards, we want to update the parameters of our model by applying these gradients back to our parameters. Exactly because of, uh, so let, let's see how this looks over, over a graph. Uh, you know, in the compute loss step, we need basically to read uh, different addresses from the node and edge type embedding tables. And similarly, uh, we need to do the same thing for updating our model parameters. However, notice that because of the sparsity that the graph structure is introducing, the accesses to memory for these reads and writes are quite irregular. We don't have any notion of locality being preserved in these uh, structures. And as a result, this workload really you know, requires uh, our, our, a special operation. And one could argue, OK, we can handle this problem of irregular accesses by just bringing all data in memory. Hence, it's not a problem. However, uh, if you start focusing on really large scale graphs and, and real world uh, cases, you will find that these representations that we have been discussing, they really don't fit in GPU memory. Uh, and hence, uh, we actually need, uh, for instance, if you take Freebase, uh, which is, uh, it has like 86 million nodes, 300 million edges, still a relatively manageable graph and you try to learn representations of size 400, you need 138 gigabytes of data, which far exceeds basically the memory of both CPU and GPU uh, of a typical compute node in the, in the cloud. So really embedding tables do not fit in, in memory, and this is a problem in, in regards to the previous workload I described. So the obvious solution to, to this problem is really to switch to an out of memory computation paradigm and one solution that has been followed is to move embeddings to compute. So uh, prominent systems uh, by Amazon, uh, this is the DGL and uh, from, by, from Facebook, PyTorch, BigGraph, they apply different techniques to move embeddings to compute. For instance, DGL really will store embeddings in CPU memory and transfer them to GPU, which gives you this transfer overheads because now your compute has to stop and ask for different uh, new vectors from, from your main memory. Uh, Python's big graph stores, partitions the, the graph and stores embeddings on disk in a way that this partition will fit entirely in the GPU memory so that you can minimize uh, the requests from GPU to, to main memory and so on. And all, following this type of partitioning, both systems try to scale across multiple machines. In the effort for of moving really embedding to, to compute and partitioning, uh, we noticed actually in our recent work that uh, these bo both systems have serious I.O. bottlenecks uh, due to data transfer. Specifically, what we observed is uh, that the key bottleneck when using them is data movement. And because of that, we have uh, GPU, the, the GPU is underutilized. So in the case of DGL, we observed GPU utilization that would max close to 20%. While in PyTorch's big graph, we observed GPU utilization that sometimes was closer to 50%, but it wasn't uh, stable. So really, uh, this bottleneck of data movement introduces uh, low utilization of the GPUs, hence uh, uh, the inefficiency of, of uh, scaling graph learning to really large scale graphs. And this is exactly the bottleneck. This bottleneck is really the main challenge that Marius addresses. So, in Marius, we actually saw how one can learn massive graph embeddings on a single machine uh, using pipelining, which is quite standard for masking I.O. And, and compute. And also, we introduce uh, a novel data replacement policy, which I'm going to describe uh, later, to actually maximize resource utilization of the entire memory uh, hierarchy and, and our compute. So uh, you see here in, in the plot that Marius can actually achieve utilization for in-memory use cases close to 70%. Uh, and for uh, on-disk uh, use cases, actually, our utilization can uh, be close to 60%. So we don't have uh, dramatic uh, drops. And this is exactly the recipe that allows us to 
be to scale graph learning over billion edge graphs, as I'll show you next. And in fact, we do so by using a single machine. So what I'm describing uh, next focuses, and, and the current version of, of Marius actually focuses on, uh, it's implemented around the single GPU execution. We are providing, uh, we're working on providing support for distributed modes and, and multi-GPU uh, modes uh, in the future. So let's see some numbers just to give you a sense of what are the benefits that we can get by following, by optimizing data movement and, and hence maximizing our GPU utilization. So we compared Marius against these other systems that I mentioned on, uh, here we measure the time to reconstruction accuracy for a standard graph embedding model over the Twitter graph. This is a graph that contains one and a half billion edges and 46 million nodes. This is again on a single machine. And for the same, to reach the same level of predictive accuracy, Marius only requires three hours versus 35 hours that are required by DJL and then five hours compared to Bidert's big graph. So Marius can really, by using these uh, uh, techniques, be 10x faster than competing methods in a single box. In fact, these gains translate, if we start comparing Marius with distributed uh, versions of these other systems, we see that Marius with a single GPU can achieve similar performance with respect to runtime that is, uh, as these systems do with multiple GPUs. So what you see here is the per epoch runtime and the cost associated with it in terms of money on, for, for a cloud deployment for learning embeddings over the free based knowledge graph that has 300 million edges and 86 million uh, nodes. And what you can see here is that a single box Marius deployment has the runtime of multi GPU solutions, for instance, uh, if we compare DGL with eight GPUs, this is in the same order of magnitude as Marius with one GPU. Uh, and because of that, you get a 5x reduction uh, with respect to the money now you need to spend for getting access to large scale graph embeddings. Uh, the good news for everyone out there is that Marius is open source. So we have released this project at uh, mariusproject.org and it's under the Apache 2 license. Uh, it is already uh, PyTorch compatible, uh, and we also offer uh, Docker containers so for easier deployment. Uh, we have uh, several data sets. I think at this point we are close to 30 something data sets that are available out of the box and, and close to uh, 10 models, and we're still working on, on uh, uh, developing and deploying uh, new models uh, over Marius. So what does it look like to use Marius? So when designing Marius, we had a couple of key principles in mind. Uh, the first one being ease of use, and that's why we opted for a no-code paradigm. So Marius only requires users to describe a config file. As you can see here in, in the demonstration, uh, you only need to define your device, the type of model you want, bat size, uh, and, and the directory where your data lives. And you can customize all these different parameters. Of course, we offer a lot of, of defaults uh, uh, through inbuilt uh, optimization methods. And you can just execute training via a simple command line. And this allows you to obtain embeddings uh, for, for your data. Via this, of course, flexibility, extensibility is another uh, major uh, principle that, that we followed. So beyond this command line and config-driven API, Marius has a Python API for users to develop their own models via standardized functions like loss function and, and trans operation, relational operations. Here you saw a definition of a trans-Z uh, embedding model. And this embedding model can be immediately incorporated through the, the Python library that Marius offers. Uh, in, your, in your training stack. So this gives you really high degree of control and customization for deploying your own models. Uh, the execution is seamless. All the optimizations that Pyrus is performing will, be, will happen in the backend. All you need to do is just specify your model through these APIs to get all the data movement wins. And finally, we designed Marius with interoperability in mind. Uh, we have a lot of data converters to transform raw data uh, to the Marius uh, input format. And for instance, we, we have support for TSV, CSV, parquet files, etc. And of course, we allow the embeddings that are uh, created by Marius and learned by Marius 
they are converted to commonly used types such as PyTorch tensors so that we ca they can be used in downstream predictive applications. So in terms of usability, these were the main principles, but I would like to go a little bit back into the fundamental ideas behind Marius, uh, specifically uh, this notion of uh, maximizing the, the utilization of GPUs and uh, discuss what is really the key innovation in our system. So pipelining is a standard technique that has been used forever. Uh, and, and we just uh, uh, designed Marius around that. But the key idea behind Marius that gives us the, the opportunity to utilize our GPUs in an efficient uh, and effective manner is this idea of what we call a buffer aware edge traversal algorithm, which is nothing more than a buffer swap ordering that is optimized for these workloads. So let me go quickly over some of these workloads just to give you an idea of, of, this, of the beta ordering. And let me start by saying that to process these large scale graphs, we really need to partition the node embeddings, the vectors that represent the nodes uh, into multiple partitions. So assuming that we have P partitions, we correspondingly group edges that uh, compose this graph into P squared edge buckets, where for instance, the edge bucket IJ will contain all edges with a source in partition I and a destination in partition J. And now during, if you remember the workload I described before that requires us iterating over all edges to learn the parameters of the model, uh, requires really that we need to iterate over all edge buckets in this structure. So the order in which these edge buckets are processed and brought into our GPU for, for processing really has a large impact in the amount of I.O. performed during training. For example, in this case, if we have, uh, we have processed the edge bucket 3.2 and we brought partitions 2 and 3 in, in our uh, buffer, processing the edge bucket 2.3 requires no extra swaps. So this is, uh, requires zero I.O. If we process 2.4, then we require one swap. If we process 4.5, we require two swaps, et cetera, et cetera. This is just to give you an idea of what I mean by I.O. and swaps. So each of these partitions can be many gigabytes. So the idea here is that really we want to minimize swapping as much as possible following a standard pipeline and out of memory execution architecture. So just to understand a little bit more of the cost, let's assume that we have these partition, uh, these edge buckets, and we have partitioned our nodes into uh, uh, six partitions here. So performing a completely random ordering over the edge buckets, uh, so we just pick uh, different edge buckets uniformly at random, requires 23 swaps. Performing locality aware ordering, like it, Hilbert uh, space filling using Hilbert uh, space filling curves that uh, have been used in other uh, graph processing systems, uh, will require uh, let's say twelve swaps here for for this uh, specific configuration of partitions and buffer size. But what we saw in our work is actually we find this lower bound that given the constraint that you want to iterate over all edge buckets. You can never process basically more than 2C minus one edge buckets per swap, where C is the capacity of your buffer. And hence, you have a minimum number of swaps that you must perform to actually iterate over all uh, your edges in your graph. So the key idea, really the key novelty behind Marius is that recognizing this lower bound, we designed a new ordering algorithm for performing these swaps to try and close and be close to this lower bound as much as possible. Hence, uh, we designed the buffer aware edge traversal algorithm, this beta ordering uh, as we call it. And the algorithm uh, performs as, as follows. Uh, you randomly initialize the buffer uh, to, set, to, to contain a random number of C partitions and, and then process these S buckets associated with these partitions. And then the way you proceed is that you use the last spot in the buffer to cycle through the rest of the partitions, processing their corresponding edge buckets. So in this case, we will swap two to three, we will swap three to four, and, and so on and so forth. We will swap uh, uh, four to five. 
performing one swap at a time. And once you have iterated over our partitions, we basically fix new C minus one partitions and repeat until all edge buckets have been processed. The nice thing with this ordering is that the beta ordering, if you keep uh, following this algorithm, it actually gives you seven swaps compared to 23 for the random and 12 for the locality aware ordering. And six was the lower bound. So as you can see, we are really close to our, our lower bound. So this is more, more you can find more details in, in the paper uh, of Marius that appeared uh, this year in, uh, it will appear in OSDI. Uh, and really this beta ordering is the key idea behind our system that allows us to maximize, to minimize the cost of data movement, hence maximize ZPE utilization and achieve uh, impressive reduction run times with respect to industrial uh, systems and also achieve monetary, uh, reduce the monetary cost required for uh, scaling uh, uh, training of graph uh, neural networks. So before we close, I would like to highlight a use case of Marius. Uh, so as part of the DARPA project, we have actually been focusing on constructing uh, scientific knowledge graphs by jointly analyzing text and prior uh, knowledge graphs. And the idea here is really to teach a system uh, how to perform analogical reasoning using prior examples from an existing seed knowledge graph and uh, raw text. So we use Marius to actually learn joint text and graph embeddings. And we are able to answer questions such as the one you see here with respect to geochronology of fossils, for instance, the Wheeler sale uh, trilobites uh, if we are to have a link prediction asking when was the geochronology of this uh, fossil, uh, you see on the lower right the, uh, the predictions of, of the system that are aligned actually with the correct uh, date uh, for, for this fossil. So a lot of exciting new uh, joint learning opportunities between different modalities have been unlocked uh, because of the Mario system. And to recap, um, Marius really, as I said, relies on these two key ideas, pipelining and the new beta ordering uh, to achieve graph learning over billion edge graphs that is 10 times faster and five times cheaper because we can perform now large scale graph learning on a single box. And again, Marius is open source. Uh, we would love to have you try Marius and please reach out uh, with feedback and questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, before getting into the Q&A, I would like to remind attendees to fi um, please fill out the session poll. And as for the first question, Chris Parisian is asking, supposing you did have multiple GPUs or even multiple compute nodes available, how well does Marius scale? And do you replicate the embeddings or, or distribute them? Uh, so, excellent question. So this is a setting, the multi-GPU setting is something we are developing now. It should actually be part of the open source very soon. Uh, for now, we are actually relying on distributed computation across the GPUs. We don't replicate uh, the embeddings. Uh, for distributed execution across different nodes, it's something that we haven't uh, focused on uh, yet. Uh, so. Uh, I'd like uh, to, to stay tuned. It, it, it will be happening uh, uh, soon as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Lots of work getting put into uh, Marius. Um, uh, he has another question. Uh, would there be a benefit in scaling? Uh, so we have found out that your, th um, your throughput is actually capped with respect to this partition. So sometimes we don't necessarily see uh, huge benefits beyond a certain point of, of scaling. Uh, so it's not really that you will always have this uh, uh, linear uh, benefits. However, um, we see benefit with respect to uh, increasing the size of the embeddings, if you will, which requires utilizing more resources. So the, the wider, the more parameters the model has, we see a lot of benefits with respect to the accuracy that you're getting, even for these settings. Um, and this will require uh, going, uh, uh, hopefully, to to basically to, to we need really to to enable uh, distributed settings because we are kind of bound of the from by, by the disk at this point. If we if we start uh, um, 
uh, increasing the, the number of parameters. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, what was the most challenging step when developing Marius? Um, coming up with this beta ordering, it required a lot of iterations and trying to understand how we minimize uh, the swaps. Uh, the rest is really good engineering and, and standard practices around uh, pipelining. But really, the secret sauce behind uh, Marius is uh, understanding that utilization is the key problem, underutilization of GPUs is the key problem, and then uh, fixing this uh, uh, problem. Now, this holds when we're talking about these workloads where you're iterating over edges. When you start going into graph neural networks, not just graph embeddings, which is something that we are working on again. Uh, now, you need to start understanding a little bit more the statistical properties of your learning problem. Uh, one of the most challenging issues when it comes to designing accurate models that have these uh, properties of, uh, and, and where training has high throughput, is the fact that you start having non-IID samples and you need to actually, this is uh, uh, against the, the standard ML paradigm. So one needs to be very careful how they perform sampling, how they uh, change uh, the order of swaps they are performing and how they process their red packets. So this is a little bit more intricate, uh, yeah, because of, of this non-IID uh, reality. Wow. So um, would you guys be developing something to catch these as well? Yes. We, we are actively working on it. It's a very, it's a very new project and we have, uh, we are actively working actually in all these directions uh, as, as we speak. So, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Is, is it, um, the, I guess it's the main project you guys are all working on. Yeah. Uh, and we see a lot of benefits actually for being able to kind of have a more universal sampling over the graph and iterating over the entire graph versus partitions uh, like DZL and uh, uh, PyTorch BigGraph. Yes, exactly. It's pretty, it's awesome that it's open source. Yeah. Let's see, First, um, no questions at the moment. Is, is there any like, like exciting things you want to kind of announce about Marius besides um, what you've already said, <laughs> like uh, in your future work? Uh, not really, not at this point. Uh, Marius is, uh, is a project that we're very excited about, uh, and especially uh, we are super excited about scientific use cases of, of the system. Uh, we are working closely with uh, uh, physicists to try and deploy Marius on uh, uh, pipelines for, for uh, analyzing interactions over particles. Uh, we're working a lot with uh, the Harvard Medical School for, for uh, predictions over uh, basically gene interactions. So a lot of exciting things uh, happening. Yeah. And of course, feel like we would love people to start using it and send us feedback. Right. I might try it out. <laughs> Well, one of the considerations that we had when designing it was not only to enable our industry that can afford running, you know, eight uh, Amazon AWS large instances with uh, GPUs, but we wanted scientists to be able to run things in a single box at that scale and speed. And this is really the direction behind Marius. Of course, distribution and scaling uh, is uh, is very close to to our roadmap you know and uh but but this is was the main goal that's amazing um someone said oh chris said um this would apply well to those gigantic molecular databases <laughs> yep i have i like the we we see exactly and and in fact in many cases we see exactly this idea that not only your graph will be uh, huge, but sometimes you might want, exactly because of the heterogeneity of a large graph, you want to start increasing the, the embeddings that you use, and sometimes you're going to terabytes. So you need to be out of memory. Uh, and, and, and distributing is not the only way to, to be able to perform this compute. Wow. Is it okay if people connect with you on LinkedIn? or? 
Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I would love to uh, have questions. You can also reach out to me at uh, my email, which is thodrek at cs.wisc.edu. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, before I wrap up, I would just like to remind everyone to update their profiles and visit sponsor booths and participate in draws. Thank you so much again, Theo Rakastinas, and um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having me.